Thank you, Jeff. Um, I hope everybody had a good lunch and had uh, some good discussions about what the business works as well as about other things. Uh, so, what I'd like to do now is have perhaps a little bit more formal discussion of, of what, we, uh, what we did. And by the way, do turn on these, um, these things that you filled out. We will use them again today and perhaps use them again tomorrow. I also have another complete set. So if we, if we have an opportunity to write another set of um, exercises, we have those, but keep the ones that you have. Um, so for a few minutes, what I would like you to do is to now intentionally pair up with someone that's in your field and discuss the exercise that you wrote right before lunch. And really the thing to focus on is what kinds of answers you think students will get and whether or not those answers will be useful to you in your classroom. Okay, so just, just five, five minutes to discuss that with somebody in your field. <laughs> So lively, and people seem to be on cats. So I will do the same thing now. But now, after lunch, it's always good to have to move around a little bit so we don't get sleepy. So switch your groups around. So now everybody should hopefully be talking to someone with a different academic area so you can compare what you think students will say. So you may need to have to move around a little bit. But I want to give for you at least five minutes on the day to have a uh, discussion with so some other areas. Estamos en la esquina de cálculo diferencial integral. 
el tema específico, tasas relacionadas y razón de cambio. Y el concepto más importante que queremos destacar ahí es el concepto de razón de cambio en problemas y de medidas, medidas independientes e independientes. Eh, no sé si lo queremos desarrollar, pero es crear cambios rápidos. Y habilidades importantes que tienen que saber los estudiantes una derivación y el planteamiento de un problema. Asumir, vamos a suponer un escenario. Nosotros hicimos la materia previa con eh, teoría y ejemplos en una lectura. Entonces, lo que queremos es ubicar una parte, como era, en varias preguntas para ver cómo el estudiante fue evolucionando. Empezamos con una primera pregunta sencilla, que dice así. ¿Es posible que en un problema de razones de cambio, todas las medidas relacionadas en él no sean fijas? Es decir, cambien con respecto al tiempo que se dice. Ok, la idea es que diga, sí, no, depende. Y el explicar puede ser de un ejemplo que tenga ahí, de la misma lectura que se dio, o que tenga que razonarlo bastante. Ambas cumplen el objetivo de que el estudiante tenga que intervenir en descentrarse en el tema y comprender no solamente lo que es una variable y cómo la razón no cambia con respecto al tiempo, sino cómo se relaciona con las demás, que es el problema. La segunda pregunta es, explique por qué en algunos casos la razón de cambio es positiva y en otros negativa. Construya un ejemplo que represente la situación. Es un problema muy interesante porque eh, generalmente el estudiante es muy memotécnico o algorítmico. Entonces, quiere resolver todas las situaciones, todos los problemas desde un mismo punto de vista. Ver la razón de cambio con una velocidad, esperando que así lo vea. Pero cuando le ponemos cambios de signos, positivos o negativos, automáticamente eso lo extrae. Y hay problemas en este tipo de tema, de que son positivas, negativas o ambas. Y la tercera pregunta es una pregunta muy simple, muy simple. Que tenemos un triángulo rectángulo. Vamos a poner tenemos una escalera apoyada sobre una pared. Y vamos a, vamos a hacer todo este dibujo, la escalera sobre la pared. En un primer momento vamos a decir que la longitud de la pared la vamos a llamar con la variable x, y le hacemos x igual 30. Ponemos otra vez el mismo dibujo. Y en el lado de la pared, ahora ponemos dx sobre dt 30. Y que él trate de decir, basado en esos eh, dos dibujos, o a partir de esas imágenes, describir lo que significa, en tres palabras de él, una razón de cambio. Esto es que nuestro Bien, ¿qué más tenemos? I like these questions. Um, they are well focused on problems that you know that students have. I know this related rates problems is always very difficult for students. And it's something that's important for them to have when they come to physics. So I appreciate that you're working on this. Um, so for, for, um, there are three questions there. If you would, to, to move the discussion forward, could you could you please repeat the, the third question? I think it was the one that had the figure in it and how that would be uh, illustrated. So, so the the last one. So so just could you just repeat the question about the last. Yes, <laughs> Lo que pasa en la pregunta 3 es que se expone un triángulo o un rectángulo. En uno de los catetos del triángulo o rectángulo se coloca x igual a 30. Y luego se coloca, bueno, se realiza otra vez el mismo triángulo o rectángulo. Y en el mismo cateto se coloca dx entre dt igual a 30. El cambio de x con respecto a t es igual a 30. So, if I understand it correctly, the idea 
did here is that you've, you've given the student the same day of third. In one case, it may be a length, perhaps in meters or centimeters, whatever. Uh, third would be a very long ladder or a very short ladder. Um, and then, um, oh, I see. Okay. Um, and then in the other case, it's the velocity that you've given, and they need to explain the difference in these situations. Um, so, for the others who are not mathematicians, perhaps some physicists or chemists, what do you think students may answer to this? I'd be interested to hear what um, either you would answer or what you think some of your students would be answering if they were taking this class and doing this problem, which is, you know, an introductory uh, calculus class and all of the engineering majors here in fact will be taking. So what do people think? Does anyone have some ideas what students may answer? Yeah? Maybe the authors of the question, could you, what do you think you'll get? What, what um, responses do you think some students will, will give you for this? Any of the whole committee can answer. Perdón, la tercera pregunta. Yes, the third one. Ok, este, bueno, aquí en eh, la tercera pregunta, le, lo, la idea es que analicen la diferencia entre lo que es la medida y lo que es la razón de cambio. Que tal vez en el cartel del triángulo rectángulo, eh, noten que la escalera aquí que decía el compañero, eh, recostada sobre la pared, indica que hay una distancia del suelo hasta, hasta la punta de la escalera, por decirlo así de 30, 30 metros en este caso, con las unidades de metros mientras que en, en el otro dibujo eh, al colocar los 30 la idea es que se entienda de que se está aumentando o que la rapidez con que aumenta es de 30 metros ya sea por minuto por segundo en este sentido It's, sí. Sí, que la escalera la están empujando en este caso. Sí. So, for a student answer, what, what do you think a student would uh, respond to this question? Posiblemente se confunda este, en primera instancia, es decir, al ver 30 y 30, si no tiene previamente la lectura o estos dos problemas, Entonces él infiera de que la razón y la distancia son iguales, que se mantienen constantes y no haga la relación. Él sería una suposición que es muy grave. Si alguno ya hizo la lectura, posiblemente se dé cuenta de que si la razón de cambio es positiva, entonces que está aumentando y que tenemos algo dinámico, mientras que en el otro es solamente algo o una situación estática. Ok, so they may have some confusion about the time dependence or lack of the time dependence. Okay? So, maybe, maybe another. Do we have another suggestion for uh, a question to, to read the group? You can just get a physics or chemistry. Yes, I'm going to explain it all.
señale en qué se diferencia su descripción física respecto al uso coloquial de la palabra. Yeah, so, so this is uh, getting a thing which I often ask my students about, which is the difference between uh, technical use of a word and the non-technical, the common language use of a word. This is very important. I don't know uh, in Spanish if there are similar causes, but in English there's the word normal. And the word normal has a different technical meaning in every field. You know, in uh, physics, we use normal often to mean uh, two things are perpendicular. But of course, in psychology, normal means something very different. And in statistics, a normal distribution is yet another very different thing. Uh, so, so there are these many uses. And the warm up examples are a very good time, I think, to. to try to, to do this, to, to bring out those ideas. So, so what do you think students will say? We know what they'll say about heat as a regular word, but what will they say about uh, heat, as you say, color in, in terms of, about color in, in thermodynamics? What will they uh, say? Aquí tal vez la palabra de uso coloquial, uno habla de tener calor. Entonces, pues muchos se van en la confusión de el calor, el concepto de calor con el concepto de energía. Entonces aquí la idea es que lleguen a punto a contestar que lo que tiene un cuerpo es energía que aumenta o disminuye, que el calor es tan solo una transferencia de energía de un punto a otro por diferencia de temperatura. Entonces que lleguen a entender esto de que el calor no es una característica del cuerpo. Sí, And so, uh, yes, this is, this is also a very good uh, example of the you know, hormone exercise. I think students will give good responses to that. Um, is there a last option? Do, do we want to hear one, one more? Maybe get one from the uh, engineers, since we're here at Tech. There were some engineers in the back. Are there any engineering questions? Respuestas de ellos, creemos, 
¿cuántos collares puede hacer? Eh, y porque puede sacar una relación usando los diamantes y puede sacar una relación usando las esmeraldas con las esmeraldas le da 10 collares 10 collares y con los diamantes va a obtener eh, 40 40 collares y luego tendría que ser por diferencia para poder saber cuántos le hacen falta para poder completar los centenos collares So, I like this question, like I said, the, uh, the connection to the real world is very good. I think, in terms of a warm-up exercise, it might be too quantitative to uh, maybe to uh, adjust that better would, would be to, to state the original uh, statement of how many of each is needed, but then to ask, Instead of giving a specific number, to ask um, if you were given some number of diamonds, say, how would you know what number of emeralds to would be needed? Or uh, perhaps to say, um, what, what, uh, here, not, not, not as a chemist, but, but as a student. Um, The, the, the confusions that students will have will be about the ability to make any if they don't have perfect numbers. Is what I think. So they'll say, "Oh well, I have the wrong ratio, so I can't do it." Uh, instead of thinking of it as a limiting number. So even to ask the question, to turn it back to them and say, "You know, this is this problem in terms of diamonds and emeralds. How would you write?" a similar problem with um, hydrogen and oxygen to make water molecules. So you make them do the inverse map as, as the question. So they explain in words, instead of giving a number, they explain in words how this is related to the chemical problem. That, that, that would also be Both are good. OK. All right. So are you feeling more comfortable? When, when we up exercise before I came, many of you had this question, how do we write these questions? How do we create more of exercise? Are you starting to feel a little better about it? More? Okay, good. You'll have more practice if you've got So, now what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about, you know, day to day, how you're implementing this, what's going on in your classroom. So, You've all probably got this general idea of the interactive lecture at this point. So the first thing you do after you get the, the students, the warm-up exercises are due. And the first thing is for you to, to read through. And you don't have to read them all. If you have a large class, you don't have to read every last student's response in detail. Because you kind of know what you are expecting. So if you scan through their responses, then you're looking for the things that you want to use in class, it can go very quickly, and then the signing points can come later. But you want to get an idea of what they understand. So you can make, think about what you want to spend more time on, what you want to spend less time on. Then you select some excerpts from their work. You maybe make an adjustment to the, to the peer instruction questions that you'll be using. Um, you know, maybe you realize, oh, everybody really understood this, so I just drop this one question and add a new one on a slightly different topic, or just take a question that you think they understand and make a more complex version of it, a more difficult version. And then when you go into class, it's really an opportunity to talk. For the students to talk among themselves, and for them to talk to you, and you to talk to them. So, There's, there's faculty notes, of course. You still have to prepare. You have to know very well what you're going to do. Uh, you have to have some stuff prepared. But based on the students' excerpts, you can do a lot. Uh, you can do much more. You can have a more interactive set. So, 
So it is about choosing the responses that uh, you use. So one thing I would say is to focus always not only on the students' misconceptions, but also on their strengths. Some of each is very useful. You, you may have even design the questions to bring out the things that they have problems with. So there's a temptation to focus on the students that have problems. But, but that's not necessary. It's always good to let the students know that they're making progress. Uh, as I said earlier on, you're motivating the students. Part of the goal here is to help them see that, okay, they're making progress, they're learning chemistry, they're learning physics, mathematics. So you want to show them that you see that they're doing some good things. Um, if possible, you want to spread, spread the wealth. So some students will always write answers that are very easy for you to use. They're the students who are very clear and direct in their writing. Um, but it's often best if you can to use some of the other students' answers as well. Even if it means sometimes you take some excerpts from their answers, you don't have to use the whole thing. And if you find that your students are being either too brief or too long in their answers, then you can show some answers that are a good one and say, okay, I'd like to see more like this. This is just about the right length. This is just about the right amount of detail to include in your answers. So they're learning a little bit about communication and they're making their writing more useful for you. Uh, but you want to try to use answers from all of your students, what the good ones as well as the bad ones. Uh, you want to choose sometimes groups of similar answers to show you. You remember one of the first slides I showed, perhaps the first slide I showed today, was of four or five of you who all said, we want to see how to write those warm-up questions. So by choosing that group, and putting them all together and underlining the things that are common to the answers, I sort of immediately said to you, okay, so many of you have the same question, and I understand that, so this is, so my promise is that I will spend a lot of time on the thing that you find important. Sometimes, um, you may even choose that to show that, you know, you perhaps are going to delay a subject, I've had the following situation where I give a reading and students look at it and they, and they say, oh, okay, the last part of it is very complicated. Uh, and they all want to know about that last part. But I look at it and I decide, okay, that part was so difficult for them. This happens often when using a new book or teaching a new class. That that subject deserves two classroom periods. So I say, okay, I see many, many of you have asked all about the same thing, and I show it on the screen, many of you ask the same question. I say, okay, so I'm going to defer that whole topic to next time. I'm not gonna do it today, but I want you to understand right now that I, I see how complicated that is for you, and I will get to it next time. For today, we'll deal with these other things. Um, Sometimes you choose many different answers to say, okay, this is a complex topic. Many of you have different issues, but, but some of you understood this, some of you understood that. So this is a good opportunity for us to learn from each other. We we'll use do many clicker questions or voting with cards questions so you can learn from each other because there are many different things that people are confused about. Um, Basic discussion on a response is also a very important thing. And I've been trying to, to model that for you here today, but because of the uh, two language difficulty, it's a little more difficult for me than it will be for you and your classes. But there are many prompts that you can use uh, based on the students' responses that are helpful. And I'd like to mention a few of them. So, for instance, you can say, you show one student's response and build your presentation from it. You can say, this response makes a good use of the idea that I want to discuss. So it's a way of telling students, okay, this is the key idea. I want you to focus on it now, and we're going to go into this topic. 
where you can say this response has many good parts, but there's a common mistake that I want to warn you about. This is that issue that we discussed early on, where people have lists of problems that they know students have. If you put it off as an example, and you say, okay, so here's a, many of you, sometimes this is a place to use a grouping. So four, I have six of you all said the same thing, and these are all our examples of the same misunderstanding of the subject. I, you know, I'm glad we discovered this today because you get points for this anyway, and there's no harm in being incorrect. But on the exam, this will be very important. So I want to highlight what's the difference between what you're saying and what is actually important and what is actually true. So it's, it's a way of, again, focusing their attention, using their own words as a way of focusing attention on this common mistake, or common difficulty. Here's some more prompts. For instance, this happens many times in mathematics or physics. There's an answer which is correct in a special case, but not in a general case. So you say, this is not always right, but under what circumstances would it be correct? And this is a good thing for students to discuss. Okay, so they know it's not always correct, but it is correct in some special cases. What are those cases? You have a discussion, and then some ask for some volunteers to say, okay, what's one special case? What's another special case? What's another special case? Um, you can say this is correct in this case, but, but there are times that it could be wrong. So now you're asking for the more general situation. And again, it's an opportunity for a discussion and to bring out to students the difference between something which is always true, something which is sometimes true, something which is only true in very special circumstances. These, uh, these things happen all the time in science and engineering. And to, to make them more aware of that, I think, in general, is an important thing. And for the specific cases, it's also important for them to see, okay, this is a rule which is always true. This is true in many cases, but not absolutely all. This is true only for this one problem, which has a peculiar situation. Um, this is similar to something we've done before, but what? Um, in physics, uh, as an example, um, later, later in the semester where we do uh, electricity and magnetism, we come to Ampere's law, which for the mathematicians is more or less equivalent to Stokes' law. It's where you have to deal with an integral around a closed loop. And, um, Earlier in the semester, we've done Gauss's law, which involves a surface integral, much like a divergence theorem, Gauss's theorem. So um, you, you do that, that uh, closed surface integral first, and then many weeks go by, and then you come to the closed loop integral. And it's important for students to see that, OK, the same style of solution is necessary. This is a case where we have to choose a contour to integrate around, just as we previously chose a surface. And the process of choosing is key to making a, a good application of this rule. Um, why is it impossible to solve this problem using the idea we learned a few weeks ago? So this is something where, again, in physics, for instance, we often we first teach conservation of energy, and then uh, students do many problems with that, and they get used to the idea that oh, every problem is easy if you use conservation of energy. Then later we come to collisions, and elastic collisions are okay, but then we have inelastic collisions where some energy is converted to heat, or to, to break the part of some chemical bonds, or something like this. And you came all of a sudden, the conservation of energy principle no longer applies. And it's important because you know students will make that mistake of trying to apply it. So you ask them very explicitly, here's, here's the situation, why can't we do this? And the whole conversation is why it can't be done. So there's no mistaking the fact that it can always be done. Okay? Um, here's some more possibilities. 
this, this can often be combined with, with the peer instruction. So you show two answers, uh, which, which may be, on the surface, at least comp compatible or comparable. Uh, they both seem to discuss the same subject, and they have some parts that are the same, that again, these are text answers, so they may have some differences as well. And you ask, which of these is better? You can have both or not. If there's a big agreement or disagreement, you may take this in different directions. This is why, as a professor, as I said earlier, you really need to be on top of the subject and very prepared to change directions very quickly. Uh, so the, the students will learn best from you when they see you think. And this is an opportunity to do that. So if you have that vote, then you can decide whether or not the discussion is warranted. Should they discuss which one is best? Or are they all in agreement with you? It may be that neither answer is particularly better than the other in your opinion. But they all appear to agree that one of them is better than the other. Then it's important for you to find out what it is about that one answer that they find more attractive. It may be that it's a clue to you about how best to explain the subject in the future. Or it may be that they're being attracted to some aspect of an answer that you consider to be unimportant from a scientific point of view. And then you need to let them know, oh, okay, I see you're focused on this one word. That word isn't actually as important as you might think. So this is a way of distracting them from a mistake they may be beginning to make. Okay. Um, you can show a response that's incomplete. This goes to my point earlier. I said that sometimes you want to use weak problems, weak answers, as well as strong answers. So if you're putting up an answer that's really not very good, you don't want to be uh, embarrassing your students. That will not make them uh, want to learn. That will not motivate them at all. So you have to say something positive. So this is the kind of thing that you can say to be positive about uh, an answer, which is not great. You can say, uh, how could this answer be improved? You can start off by saying, oh, this is a good answer, but we could make it even better. How could it be improved? It costs you nothing to say that it's good. As long as you're saying that it can be improved anyway, the students will understand, well, OK, so it's not complete. We can do one. You can show an answer that's very good. I say, why do you think I like this answer so much? And this is an opportunity to put up a good answer and really praise that student's help. This is a very good answer. Uh, it's very well written and it makes some very important points. What points do you think I am finding so useful, so important? So this is, again, ways of choosing different answers, spreading out which student's answers you use, and how you discuss them how you ask your students to discuss it in the class. Connecting to peer instruction. I know Professor Frazier made a very strong uh, pitch that, that just-in-time teaching and peer instruction go very well together. And I absolutely agree with this. So I'd like to talk for a minute about how that connection can be made. So, one possibility is to take a warm-up question and use that in class. So you reproduce a warm-up question completely and go directly to that um, stage of saying, convince your neighbor of your answer without even needing to do that first vote. You just say, okay, this was the warm-up question. Now we're going to discuss it. You all remember what your answers were from last night. Now convince your neighbor of your answer and then go directly to the vote. So you save a little time on that first vote, which didn't require a discussion. Or you can say choose a warm-up that most students did well and make a more difficult version of it to make a concept test, one that you'll use in class. So you, you look at the warm-up answers and you say, oh, 90% of my students had a very good answer to so I don't need to spend time on the basic question. I can go to a more advanced question. And then 
have the class focus on that. So this is, again, an opportunity to go deeper into your subject. Uh, I believe Dr. Frazier, because I've seen him talk before, he sent me some subset of his slides. I didn't see all of them. He sent me a few. He, so I believe he showed you a thing that said that when you do peer instruction, you can cover less material. But I think that's true. I think just-in-time teaching is one of the ways of getting some of that material back. Or if not covering more material, at least of covering the material that you will cover at a deeper level. Because you have this transfer of information between you and your students in advance, and then that helps you to have a deeper discussion in the classroom. So you can really get to uh, more subtleties of the subject, more fundamental parts. Uh, this last one says, base a warm-up question on a concept test you plan to use. So perhaps you have some concept tests for peer instruction that you've worked out in advance, or you found um, uh, from a colleague or online some library of useful questions. I know at Harvard they have a very big library of concept test questions that you can use. If you plan to use one of those, you can do the reverse of this, which is to make a warm-up question based on the concept test that you have intended. So you start from the concept test, and you say, OK, how would I get students prepared for that? And make, make a warm-up question out of it. So they, in some sense, talk about or you know, answer an open-ended question or an ambiguous question about the subject, and then in class, you would use as a concept test something that has a more clear cut answer. So you can really see that they've developed the skill of working. So using the students' responses. I, I can't stress this too much. Always say something positive. Even if you're using an answer that, like that one that I showed you earlier, where the student was talking about how fast the uh, system can dissipate heat that's added in the ideal gas. It's really a pretty crazy answer. Uh, and I might not use that one in class. But if I did, if I, if I had several students that had that issue about the speed of the process, I might choose to use several of those and say, now, I like these answers. These are very good. But they do highlight something that I want to talk about a little bit. And that is the uh, answer to this question doesn't really depend on how quickly he is at. So you're only saying something positive, even about bad answers. You can say, this is true, but what if something else occurs? That could be said about that middle one, or the first answer I had to that question. Um, you can say, this makes sense, but something is missing. Um, you can say, this is conceptually perfect, but how can we make it more quantitative? Sometimes students will uh, give a qualitative answer, but then kind of give you no idea if they know how to actually do a calculation. And you want to say, OK, we can make this a little bit more specific. You can even say stuff like this. This is a good answer, but I think you may have misunderstood the question. <laughs> so what is that? that means this is completely tangent to my point. But I like the way you said it. So I would say something nice to you and then and then bring you back to the subject that's really important. Um, so other ideas. These are just tips. And, and there are many. And at this point, by the way, I think people probably have questions again about how to do this. So by all means, Anytime you want to interrupt me, uh, please, please do. Just put up a hand and, and we'll get the microphone. Um, so, I said this before, I'll say it again. It's very important to explain what you're doing on the first day of class. I tell students, we're doing these warm-up exercises. The idea is to help you know what's important to prepare for class. It's to help me understand what uh, problems you have with the subject and what things that you find here so I can use our classroom time more effectively. Uh, I think
think you'll learn more and we'll be able to, to learn more about physics. So you'll be able to become a better engineer, better scientist. You'll understand the subject very well by the end of the semester. Just meet me halfway and, and you know, we'll use this technique together and it will benefit everything. Um, I said this also. There's no need to read every last student response before class, especially if you have a lot of students. If you have 60, 70 students in your class, you may only need to read 20 or 30 before class. I have 200. I still only read 20 or 30 of them before class. If I'm assigning points to them, I can do that later. Um, sometimes people have a tendency to say, okay, We've got these warm-up questions. I'm going to do those all at the beginning of class. Or I'm going to do those all at the end. I would discourage that. I would say it's probably best to scatter the students' answers to the warm-ups throughout the entire class period. So they're not feeling like, OK, this is an isolated thing, and then we do the real class. It's better to say, OK, this is the, the whole thing is the real thing. Your, your lecturing, the uh, group discussions, the peer instruction, the, the looking at the uh, answers from the warm-ups, it's all mixed together so that you get the most effective uh, the most effective discussion, the most effective lecture, the most effective learning. It needs to be routine. One mistake I think that people sometimes make is they feel like, oh, I want to get this class started normally uh, so I'll be more comfortable and then I'll start doing the world later in the semester. I think that's a mistake because you're the only one that knows what's normal. The students, the first day of class is the day that they decide what's normal in your class. And they've had many different professors and some of them are very good, some of them are very crazy, some of them are boring, who knows. But they learn very quickly what's normal in your class. So actually, this idea of explaining what is normal in a class is a very important first day thing. Monica, can you the microphone? Monica. I wanted to ask you, how would you be the first class of the semester? Well, I think that class would be the first class of the semester.
class where you get rid of the, the weaker students. And I don't want them to feel that way. I want them to, to understand that my perfect semester, every one of them would learn everything, and they would all have an A at the end of the semester. And I really believe that. Uh, and, and they should believe that I believe that. So if I spend an extra half an hour building confidence with them, that's time that's very well spent. And they will pay much greater attention to me for the entire rest of the semester. I can give up those 20, 30 minutes. Um, what I do do on the first day of the class, though, is I do ask them to bring their clickers on the first day. And I have some practice questions that aren't physics, but actually have a very important goal in mind. So on the first day of class, they bring their clickers. And first of all, the point is to make sure that they've all registered their clicker. Because in order for them to get the points, they have to put the, the ID number up back into our computer system so I know what name is associated with what physical device. But then, so I say, all right, we're going to do some practice questions just so, you, so we can see that everybody's registered their device correctly. But then the questions go to the same issue. So the first question I ask them is, which of these things are you good at? And I give them a whole long list that includes, I'm good at playing sport, I play a musical instrument, I'm good at dancing, I'm good at singing, I'm good at, singing, I'm good at cooking, I speak more than one language, I, um, I'm good at video games, I'm, I'm a good uh, parishioner in the church, I do, you know, it's a list of about 10, 12 things. And I get their answers. And you know, I display them on the screen, so many of you are good. I say, oh, very good class. Many of you are good at so many things. I'm very impressed. So I'm praising them, I'm letting them know how important this is. And the next question is, how did you get good at what you're good at? And the choices are, I watched somebody talk about it. Uh, I watched the videos online about that. I spent many hours practicing. I worked with very closely with a person who's an expert in this area. So, and then there's some, you know, choices A and B, choices C and D. So, and, and in the end, as you would expect, the most popular answers are: I spent many hours practicing, or I worked with someone. Uh, who's an expert and he spent many hours practicing. And I said, okay, so what did we just learn? If you want to get good at physics, you have to spend many hours practicing. So I tell him, okay, this is going to be a difficult course. I'm going to require many, many hours of hard work from you. But I've said it in such a way and I've tied it to something that they like. So they get it. They practice with the clickers, but they've also see that I'm on their side and that I value the things that they're good at and that I expect them to work very hard and put in many hours both on their own and working with me. So I've made many points by doing that. It's a very long answer to a very short question. Thank you. Um, so I, I would say also, upper level students can handle a more exploratory question more difficult questions. Uh, you can make connections to the introductory subjects. So sometimes if you have uh, an advanced class, you're using some materials that students were supposed to learn in a previous class. The warm-up question can often be essentially of the form, do you remember how to do this thing that you learned last year? And then you can find out really how well students remember how to do that, whether you need to do a little review, or if um, they're, they're very well prepared, and then you can just go ahead. This is a way of checking up on your colleagues who teach the earlier courses. Um, and then again, don't worry about the details. The only thing that's just in time teaching is central is this idea of feedback from what students are doing at home into the classroom. And then, of what you do in the classroom, helping you to design the next round of, of homework questions. If you get that feedback loop going, 
It doesn't matter what platform you're using. It doesn't matter what time of day the questions are due. It doesn't matter how you grade them. Many, many things are up to you and your sense of what it's like with your students. So in fact, I would list some of these. These are what I would call the matters of taste, the matters of preference. These are the things that you choose to suit your class and your students. So exactly how long before class the warm-up is due? If I'm teaching a class in the afternoon, I might have the warm-up due two hours before class. If I'm teaching a class around midday, you might say, well, let's just have my problem due in the first thing in the morning. If I'm teaching a class that's due first thing in the morning, I don't want you know, the thing due at 6 in the morning so that I have to get up early and be working before I even come into to the school. Instead, I'll say, all right, have it due at 5 o'clock the previous day. Then after dinner, I can look at this a little bit, or I can do it in the morning if I like. But give yourself the time that you need. I think I wouldn't do it way in advance. You know, two, three days is too much, because then it's not fresh in the students' minds. But anything that's close enough to be fresh in their minds, 24 hours, 36 at the most, um, up to just an hour before class, if you want to just take that hour and have nothing um, to distract you in the last hour before class, that's fine. How rigorously you grade. I'll tell you what I do is I see each warm-up exercise, which is usually two or three questions, is worth a few points. Maybe they all add up to 10% of the whole semester. And for each assignment, they either get full credit or zero. And if they give me anything that's halfway reasonable, they get the full credit. If they give me complete garbage, if it just says, you know, random letters, or it says blah, 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 or, you know, it's some poetry that they wrote, or something that's not relevant, then they get zero. But if it's even they have an answer to the question, as we were saying before, they tell me what's their gut feeling, what's in their heart about the subject, then fine. I'll give them the full credit. That's fine. I can be done very quickly. 10 seconds per screen to, to grade these um, But if you want to, if you have a smaller class and you want to give them you know, 1 point, 2 points, 3 points, or 1 point, 2 points, 5 points, whatever, you, you can make, it, make up your own grading scheme um, and do whatever you like. Uh, it's, it's really up to you and your sense of what is appropriate for your class. Um, how many questions you put on each assignment? So again, what I do, if I'm lecturing two days a week or three days a week, each assignment will have two or will be due on the day of the lecture, and there'll be two or three questions on each one. But I have colleagues who teach a class that just meets once a week for three hours. So in that case, maybe you have six or seven questions on the one big one. Um, if your class is meeting four days a week, maybe you only do the warm up three days a week. That kind of thing is really up to you. Um, how many points are they worth? You know, again, uh, I tend to make all the warm ups combined about 10% of the class. But it could be 5%, it could be 20%, whatever you think works. Um, Credit versus extra credit. You know, in the U.S., students love extra credit. There's something magic about these words, extra credit. I think they learn it from the high school teachers. I don't know if it's so common in Costa Rica or elsewhere, but American students love extra credit. So if you say something is extra credit, and then everybody gets almost all of it, what have you changed? You've changed nothing. But the students will work very hard for it for some reason. Um, so I find that kind of thing very useful. Um, you know, if your students learn more from it, it's okay to trick them a little bit. Um, and then before every class, or oh, I already mentioned this, you know, if you're meeting every day or four days a week, maybe you don't.
don't do as every, every last class. Some people's classes be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It would be okay to do it only Monday, Wednesday, or only Tuesday, Thursday. I would do it every day. They do it just one or two questions. But it's up to you. As long as you're doing it some, you're doing it on a routine way. The routine is the important thing. So, the results of this. In the end, I think this is really what's important. You do just in time teaching. You make this work. Several good things happen. The students will be better prepared for class. That's very clear. They've read the material. They've thought about it a little bit. They're better prepared for class. They've given some thought to the ideas. They're familiar, they're familiar with the jargon. So they're, they're, they're more ready. Also, faculty are better prepared for the students. This is very important. One thing is you may identify some more of these misconceptions, these ideas that students have that get in the way of their learning the real subject. Um, some of those are known, some of those you may have already identified if you're a very experienced instructor, but some of them may be new to you, where the underlying ideas that students have may be new to you. You can also make that just-in-time adjustment to the coverage, to what you're doing during class on that day. And in the end, you can spend class time more productive. The students can interact more during class with each other. They can interact more with you. You can get deeper into the subject than you would have if you walk in there just to give a lecture where you're really not sure what the students know and they're less prepared and there's, there's just less, less common ideas between you and your students. It's getting you and your students, um, you know, in English we have this phrase on the same page. It comes from music. You know, if everybody's playing on the same page of music, then it sounds good. If some of the orchestra is on a different page, it doesn't sound as good. So, we, we've now reached to the student perspective. And here, um, do, do, what time do you want to do the break? Uh, ten minutes? Okay. I bet we can't even get through this in ten minutes. But this is, because this is what I've already talked about a little bit. But I think this is very important. This is how the students view it. Now, if you have those evaluations, I could rephrase this. I would say this part of my talk is about how you get the students to write the best things about you as an instructor. So the first five minutes are critical. This is, this is where students either decide that they trust you or they don't. You know, there's, there's a study that's been done in the U.S. where they have uh, Students view a video of a professor just five minutes. Five minutes video. And then they ask, if you had this person as an instructor, do you think they would be excellent? Would they be very good? Would they not be good? Would they be absolutely terrible? How would you rate them on these various things? And in five minutes, the students and the subjects of this study can identify with very good accuracy what those professors actually get from their own students. Five minutes. So then there was a follow-up on that study. They said, okay, students can identify in five minutes who's a good professor, who's not a good professor, who I would like and who I will not like. Let's see how quickly they can do it. It turns out that it takes students 30 seconds. From a 30-second video clip, they can decide whether or not they're going to like you as a professor or not. And then they took it one level deeper. They said, can they do this without the sound? So it's just the visuals. No, the sound is turned off still in 30 seconds with no sound. They can decide whether they're going to like you or not. And it has to do with body language, with whether you smile, with whether you 
look out and make contact, or if you're here writing on the board like this, you know they know they're not going to like that. So there's many things that you can do, and that first five minutes is very important. Be very honest and direct. I, I answered this earlier in answer to a question. Explain to the class, this is why we're using clickers, this is why you have warm-up assignments, etc. It's for your benefit. You'll have uh, better success in this class, and you'll do better in your advanced classes. You'll get a better job, you'll get paid more, get a nicer car, uh, etc. So you're letting them know it's a benefit there, career, and, and you promise to explain it how. If they don't understand how this is beneficial to them, you owe them an explanation. It's not just because I'm the professor and my word is law. It's because you're a smart person and you have a lot of experience, and you've thought about how they will learn best. And you, you want to give them the benefit of your experience. Hold yourself and students to high standards. If you want your students to work really hard, and if they're going to learn calculus, differential equations, physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, uh, linear algebra, engineering, fluid mechanics, whatever it is, it's going to be hard. You want them to work really hard. They're going to have to put in a lot of hours alone, maybe working with groups, working in teams, they're in engineering practice, they're, they're going to be doing some projects. They're going to have to work really hard. They need to see that you work really hard. So we're all professors. How many of you in high school, maybe or during college, you had some regular job? Who had a regular job? Working in office, working in a factory, driving a truck, anything. Yeah. Who has had a real job? I was a security guard. It I was a security guard for several summers. Uh, I also worked, this is embarrassing, as a telephone salesman, selling subscriptions to the newspaper on the telephone. I call Saturday morning early and wake people up and convince them to buy something while they were only half awake. <laughs> If you have a job like that, you know if your boss is lazy or if your boss is not someone that you like, you don't work as hard. If your boss is somebody that you respect and you see that they're working harder than anyone else in the office, they're working harder than anyone else in the factory, they have your respect, you're willing to work hard. It's no different with students. No different. If they see, oh, Professor Gavin, he works all day and all night. I see an email, he answered me at 2 a.m. Then you come in and you say, oh, you know, I was grading your tests all day yesterday, all weekend, whatever it is. Tell them you're working hard. It's okay. Tell them you're working hard. Then they will understand that it's part of the deal. They shouldn't be working less than you. Because they're the ones that are the students. They should be learning the subject. You already know. So you set an example, they'll work hard. And then be very careful not to offend them by accident. It's very easy as a professor to very accidentally offend the student. You know, you're in class, the student asks a question, how do you do this thing? And you say, oh, that's easy. You've just told them. Just by saying that word easy, you just told them. Oh, you should have known that. That's a simple thing. You shouldn't even need to be asked. It could be worse. You could answer the question, but you don't. <laughs> so it can, it can come from your body language. It can come from your tone of voice. Uh, it can come from the words that you use. You know, in mathematics, we often have this phrase, which is obvious on inspection. You say that? This is obvious on inspection. Um, in physics, we sometimes use this too in derivations. This is a terrible thing to say to students because it's not obvious to them. The word trivial 
is another one that sometimes we know. This is a trivial problem. You know, to us, it doesn't mean it's a stupid problem. It means it's a problem with which we're very familiar. It's okay, we're very familiar with it. We've been doing this for 20, 30 years. It's okay for it to be very familiar. But to the students who are just learning, it's not very familiar, it's not trivial. So it's better not to use this word. You're a leader. You're, you're in charge. It's like being a military officer or being the, the executive of a, of a company, chief executive of a company. So you have to be a leader. University work is hard, and students look to you for motivation and for support. And you don't disappoint them. They're expecting you to motivate them. You know, sometimes we say that. When we're complaining about our students, we say, oh, the students don't work very hard. Well. They're totally unmotivated. Well, why are they unmotivated? Who provided them with some motivation? When they're a student, it's your job. You may not believe this, but I'm telling you, it's your job as a professor to motivate the students who are not motivated. Some of them, you know, they're great. They come to you already motivated. They're self-motivated. They believe in the importance of your class already. And they'll work very hard. But they're not everyone. And sometimes it's more fluid. You know, some students may be very motivated in the first week of class, but by the sixth week, they're exhausted. Or they've had some problem. You know, they have some family problem. You don't even know what it is. They have some financial problem. They have a friend who's ill. Who knows what the problem is, but they're unmotivated. You may not even know it, but you as the professor should be always providing additional motivation, helping the students who aren't motivated in any given moment see, okay, if this is really important, this is a guy worth following. If he says this is important, I believe him because he's got my trust. You're building a team. If you want students to work together as a team, then you should let students know that you and they are working towards a common goal. I think this is important. If you ask the question, what is the purpose of the university class? Well, the purpose is for students to learn. The purpose is not for a faculty member to draw a nice salary. The purpose is for the students to learn. If that's not happening, then it doesn't really matter why. It only matters that it's not happening. And there's only one person that could possibly be the one responsible for fixing it, and that's the professor. So it's a team exercise. You and the students have the same goal for them to learn the most. So you let them know that on the first day. You say, we're a team. We're working together. I have the same goal that you do. That goal is for you to learn the most mathematics the most chemistry, the most engineering. And we're going to work together on this. That's what you tell them. I work hard, you work hard. This is also important. Remember that the students are learners. They're not already learned. They're not already finished. Don't expect them to be sophisticated users of ideas they've just seen for the first time. Sometimes we do that. We said, okay, so we're learning how to determine whether a power series converges. So we learned about power series for the first time last week. We read about the convergence tests last night. Tomorrow we have an exam. Why can't you do this? What's so difficult? But that's not fair. They're not, they're not already ready to do that. So you have to remember that Learning is a process, it has a time scale to it. You can't rush that time scale. That time scale is built into how fast students can read, how many other subjects they're learning, how quickly they can absorb new ideas, how long it takes to practice skills in order to get good at them. Uh, it's often said that you, know, you, need, you need practice. Practice is the only way to get good at something. So if you've only given students 12 hours since they first saw something, 
How much practice could they possibly have? So even if they just are beginning to scratch the surface of a new idea, it's, it's important to tell them that they're doing well to know a little bit. And it's not so important to tell them that they should have known something that this should be easy. Better to, better to help them see that they're making progress instead of punishing them for not making progress as quickly as you might guess. OK. So uh, that ends that section. I think this is now the perfect time for our break. And we'll come back and talk about some evidence that this actually worked.